This is the record that God has given to us, eternal life, and this life is in his Son. He who has the Son has the life. He who does not have the Son of God does not have the life. He who believes on him is not condemned, but he who believeth not is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. For there is no other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast." For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing is able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. For of him and through him and to him are all things, to whom be the glory forever. Amen. Before we begin our study of God's word this morning, let's go to the Lord and ask his guidance and direction on our study. Father, we're thankful that we have your word, that it is uh, given in a way that preserved it from any human error, but it is more than simply without error, but it contains within itself the very mark of absolute truth, that it is not simply the negation of error, but it is the presence of unadulterated truth, and that because we have this uh, truth before us, We can come to understand things as they are. We can understand you as you are, and we can understand uh, us as we are. Father, as we study this passage this morning, help us to understand you a little better, that we may recognize that you do not always fit into our preconceived ideas and preconceived notions, and that often we put you in a box, and that that is something that doesn't limit you, but it does limit us in terms of our understanding and appreciation for you and our uh, trust in you. Father, we pray that you would challenge us with what we study today. In Christ's name, amen. Open your Bibles to 2 Kings chapter 3. 2 Kings chapter 3, and we'll just have a brief review of what I covered last time. Focal point last time was on the fact that in this chapter, we see God act in a somewhat surprising way. As we start at the beginning of the chapter and move down through the chapter, nothing really surprises us. In fact, it seems to build a certain pattern, one that we have seen in other places, other times in the Scripture, where we see uh, God's people, the Jews, come together in order to fight an enemy. And as we come to the Uh, climax of the passage, we seem to be on the cusp of a tremendous victory, and then we hit the last verse in the chapter, and it seems to have, they seem to have snatched defeat from the jaws of victory. And yet it leaves us with certain disturbing questions, because what seems to motivate that victory for the enemy is the fact that Misha, the king of Moab, sacrifices his firstborn son, his heir, an adult son, in a burnt offering on the walls of the city, this human sacrifice, this immolation of his son, and this turns the tide of battle. And at the end, we just simply read and uh, that the armies of Israel left and went home. We're left with certain uh, questions. And some of the features in the text that we hope for for more clarity are not there. What this does is it forces us, I believe, to think a little more deeply and a little more profoundly about what is going on here and the role of God in history. And that is something that I've become more aware of in my own study of God's Word. And as I come to understand how and why God wrote it this way, is that He doesn't give us the answers all the time. He gives us the framework for the answers, and we have to dig deeply in order to really come to understand what is going on. We have to think about him. God just doesn't hand us uh, the answers on a silver platter so that we can uh, sort of satisfy our easy curiosity, but it is the revelation of himself and his word is given in such a way that it constantly pushes us to read and study and to think more deeply and more profoundly about what is said in Scripture. God does not let us off the hook 
with simply a simple on-the-surface meaning. Now, having said that, I'm not talking about some kind of mystical hermeneutic, some kind of uh, secondary spiritual or allegorical meaning. What I am talking about is simply that we need to study all of God's Word and comparing Scripture with Scripture and our understanding of God in other passages in such a way that we can truly come to answer the, the text, the questions raised by the text, and come to understand uh, who God is. Now in Second Kings chapter 3, we are faced with a battle, a battle where three kings come together, uh, the king of the northern kingdom of Israel, uh, who is Jehoram, uh, calls upon the uh, Jehoshaphat, the king of the southern kingdom of Judah, as well as the king of Edom, to join together in an alliance to uh, conquer, as a form of discipline, the king of Moab, because the king of Moab has exercised uh, his independence and has revolted against the suzerainty or the authority of the northern kingdom of Israel, which has held the kingdom of Moab under under their thumb since the time of Omri. Omri was a tremendous military conqueror. He's an extremely strong leader. And even though the Bible doesn't portray him in much of a positive light because the scriptures are giving us God's editorial view of these kings of Israel, and he is presented as being evil in the sight of God because of his idolatry, because of how he opened the northern kingdom of Israel to the horrible uh, fertility worship of the Baal and the Asherah by uh, marrying his son, uh, entering into an alliance with the Phoenicians, and he marrying off his son to Jezebel, the daughter of the king of the Phoenicians, who was also the high priest of Baal. And so these the Amrids, which is the term for this dynasty, Amri, Ahab, and Ahab's uh, two sons, are always viewed as being evil. But what the evidence that we have from literature that we've discovered through archaeology, one of which we'll look at later on this morning, which is called the, the Moabite Stone, which was written by Misha, indicate that Omri was a real powerhouse in the ancient world. He built, he expanded the power base of the northern kingdom of Israel. He expanded their military. He conquered various uh, neighboring countries such as uh, Moab and made, uh, made them pay tribute to the northern kingdom. And so he had established uh, himself very, very, very well at that time. And writers in Assyria uh, Moab, Egypt, recognized his power and the influence of the northern kingdom of Israel. So all of that confirms evidence that we have in Scripture. Last time we saw that the first three verses simply give us a summary of God's evaluation of the reign of Jehoram, who is the second son of Ahab to become king, uh, following the death of the first king, who is Ahaziah. First king uh, was on the throne something probably a little bit less than two years because of the way they counted reign. When the scripture says two years, it would assume that the even if he only reigned part of a year, that was considered the first year and then a second year. So it could have been as short as only six or eight months, and it could have been, uh, and but it wasn't any longer than than a two years. Now, Ahaziah was evil because he followed in everything that uh, Ahab and Jezebel had brought into the land. But with his defeat, the defeat of, uh, by Elisha of, of Baal, of um, uh, both in, ter- in the north and in the south, exercised his, showed that God was, Yahweh was God, that when Jehoram took the throne, he put away the Baals, but he still continued in the idolatry set up by uh, Jeroboam. So verse 2 gives us the uh, evaluation. He did evil in the sight of the Lord, but not like his father and mother, for he put away the sacred pillar of Baal that his father had made. Nevertheless, he persisted in the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nevat. What we see here is that the core of evil is idolatry. The core of evil is idolatry, and when one rejects the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of the Bible, and substitutes something else 
for the worship of God, then they have committed this root sin of idolatry, this arrogance against God, and that is the core of all evil. We fall prey to that, lest you think that you have uh, somehow avoided that because we don't bow down to statues made of uh, wood or gold or silver, but we construct mental idols. We construct in our minds ideas of who God is and what he looks like that don't really conform to what Scripture says. This is a mental form of idolatry. You see it in various ways in people's lives. They have limited views of God. They have wrong views of God. They have views of Jesus that are not formed from the Scripture but are formed by some kind of independent uh, religious view of Jesus as some weak, pasty, uh, wimpy figure who uh, went to the cross and, and died as he's portrayed in many different uh, pictures as this effeminate figure that uh, just couldn't quite deal with the issues of, of life at the time and that we're all supposed to be little doormats because of that. And that's just another form of idolatry. So idolatry is the core issue here, the core sin, and because of the idolatry in the northern kingdom, God is not really going to bless the northern kingdom. There will be times when it appears that he is because he is simply extending grace to them to give them time to repent or to change or to turn back to him. Sometimes in our lives, God's grace is extended to us and we mistake that blessing as approbation from God rather than God is really giving us the opportunity to change and to turn back to him. Uh, Jehoram, even though he wasn't as bad as his parents, is still considered evil. Uh, the next few verses, as I pointed out last time, tell us the circumstances. He's faced with a problem. That's how we come to a point of application. We often are faced with problems. They may not be the same problems, but we're all faced with problems. And his problem was that Misha, the king of Moab, was in revolt and refusing to pay his tribute. And this tribute was necessary for the northern kingdom in order for them to balance their budget. And they had imposed this excessive tribute of 100,000 uh, lamb skins and the wool from 100,000 rams, or excuse me, just 100,000 lambs and the wool from 100,000 rams. And this was necessary to uh, take care of the needs in the northern kingdom. After Ahab died, Moab, uh, the king of Moab uh, thought that they were weak now, and so he quit paying the tribute. Now, Jehoram is going to finally do something about this after uh, the, a couple of years have gone by. And so he calls out the army in verse 6, and he goes to Jehoshaphat in verse 7 to uh, bring, ha, call, have him come and ally with them uh, in an attack against Moab. Now, this map will help you sort of picture where things are. The, reg re the region that is marked out in uh, purple there up here is the area of control of, of, um, of uh, the northern kingdom of Israel. And you'll see that uh, in the middle here, just running north of the Dead Sea, there's a blue line. That's the Jordan. The area in purple to the right of the Jordan River or to the east is the Transjordan. And the area uh, north here was area that was given to the tribes of Israel. But when you move south, you see the territory of Ammon, Moab, and Edom. These three uh, nations bordered Israel. And God had told them in Deuteronomy that they were not to that the Jews were not to take possession of that land. The Ammonites and the Moabites were distant cousins. They were the uh, offshoot of Abraham's nephew Lot and the incest of his two daughters with him. Deuteronomy 2.9, we saw last time that Israel was not to take that land for a possession. Now, the other thing we looked at last time was a comparison with the events in 1 Kings uh, chapter 22 and the battle there. What was significant is that in that particular battle, in verse 5, as, a as uh, Ahab had approached Jehoshaphat to join with him in the battle to free Ramoth-Gilead, 
In verse 5, the first response of Jehoshaphat was uh, saying, well, let's inquire the word of the Lord. And the point that I was making last time is that in the contrast between the two scenes and the writers, remember, 1 Kings and 2 Kings were originally one book when it was written. And so the writer is intending for us to see uh, and to compare and contrast these two battles. In 1 Kings chapter 22, Jehoshaphat, after saying uh, pledging to follow and to join with Ahab, says, let's inquire of the Lord. In 2 Kings chapter 3, he does not inquire of the Lord. He just uh, allies himself with, um, with Jehoram in the north. And this, the point that I was making is that this shows a spiritual deterioration on the part of Jehoshaphat. He is not seeking the Lord first. There's no doctrinal orientation there. And the first thing that should be part of our uh, problem solving is to make sure that we understand the will of the Lord uh, through his word in any particular uh, situation. What are the guidelines? What are the principles uh, that we should be going to in that particular, those particular circumstances? And I pointed out that in the event of First Kings chapter 22, Ramoth Gilead was part of the Transjordan that God had given to Israel. But the problem we have in Second Kings 3 is that, according to Deuteronomy 2, that the Jews were not to exercise control and were not to take possession of Ammon, Moab. And so this was in violation of God's, God's will. Now, in the first Kings passage, in the first Kings passage, they were doing a right thing, but they were doing it in a wrong way. And the wrong way was because it was being done by Ahab, Ahab was out of fellowship with God. He was an idolater. He probably was not even a believer. And he was certainly not in obedience to God, and God was not going to do anything to truly bless the northern kingdom. He had already announced to Ahab that that he would take his life and that he would remove him from the throne and that he would judge his household and that his sons would be the last of his dynasty. So when we come to 2 Kings chapter 3, now they're doing a wrong thing, and they're, again, they're going to do it in a wrong way. And Jehoshaphat is going to ally himself with the northern kingdom, and this is wrong. It, it uh, violates the principle that we find clearly stated in the New Testament, what fellowship has light with darkness, what fellowship has uh, the believer with uh, Belial, what fellowship does a, uh, re- a rebellious uh, person have with a believer or a believer with a rebellious person. And so that principle there that we have in 1 Corinthians also applies in many areas of our lives is that we are not supposed to engage in intimate alliances, uh, primarily marriage, with unbelievers because of the influence that they can have upon us. And we see something of this negative influence here in Second Kings chapter uh, chapter 3 as Jehoshaphat allies himself with Jehoram in the north, and he has no interest, at least at this point, in seeking the uh, will of God. And so Jehoshaphat said, how are we going to go? By way of the uh, wilderness of Edom. And so this is the way they went. Verse 9 says that they went with uh, the king of Israel, went with the king of Judah and the king of Edom. They marched on that roundabout course seven days, And there was no water for the army nor for the animals that followed them. Now, here is a map. This is actually the routes here are routes from the Exodus. And the reason I use this is because there is a parallel here, that there are certain things that happen in this episode that cause us to think back to what happened during the Exodus and to show the differences that occurred and how God gave victory to the uh, conquest generation and how he is not going to ultimately give victory to Jehoram and Jehoshaphat. If you notice on the map we see in this blue line, this is the uh, line uh, that that the uh, conquest generation followed, not the disobedient generation, but the conquest generation that they followed on their way into the land. They were not allowed to pass through Edom by the king of Edom, so they had to go south down to Itzion uh, Gever, which is down 
uh, just on the northern tip of the Gulf of Aqaba near Elat. This is a pretty barren area. And they come around to the east, and they have to go completely around Edom and around Moab, and then they entered up through the territory of Ammon as they crossed into the land. And they were, the king of Moab at the time of the Exodus was very threatened by them, and so there were a couple of, uh, a couple of battles there, but God had warned Moses that they were not to take territory, so they just simply fought uh, defensive, a couple of defensive actions. Now what happens in 2 Kings 3 is there's a similar route that's followed, where these three kings are going to come down to, through the south, which is extremely dry, barren territory, cross over by way of Edom, and come up to Moab from the south uh, in order to, to attack them. These are just a couple of pictures to show you the very inviting, beautiful territory that they were uh, moving through. As you can tell, it is... Uh, uh, filled with uh, many different kinds of vegetation and trees. And, of course, I'm being facetious. And so after seven days, they were without water. And God had to perform a miracle uh, in order to uh, provide for, for them and to supply for their, their needs. And so they come to this point where they are completely uh, at a loss, uh, as to what God is doing with them. And, of course, the first thing that we see is the reaction of the king of Israel, Jehoram, and he blames God. The uh, principle here is that we're, uh, whenever we are out of fellowship and things don't go right, the first thing we do is we blame God. It goes all the way back to the garden when Adam uh, sinned and God confronted him. He said, Lord, it was the woman you gave me. In other words, it's your fault. And that seems to be the way most believers handle the will of God in their life is in such a way that they can eventually blame God for their bad decisions. And so the king of Israel is no different, and he, begin, he blames God, and he says, Oh, alas, for the Lord has called these three kings together to deliver them into the hand of Moab. And so he is completely negative. Uh, in terms of his mentality, his attitude in blaming God. But Jehoshaphat here wakes up a little bit spiritually, and he now finally asks the question, is there no prophet of the Lord here that we may inquire of the Lord by him? And so one of the servants of the uh, king of Israel said, well, Elisha, the son of Shaphat, is here who poured water on the hands of of Elijah. Pouring water on the hands of Elijah was a role of a servant. He was helping to wa him wash his hands, wash his feet. And so that was the role of someone who was uh, an apprentice to a prophet. Uh, it's very interesting as I, that I have seen, as I've had many different um, experiences in different congregations, different churches, and different de denominations. One of the things that I have noticed that I think is a, uh, a, a good approach has certain values to it, is in, in many churches, uh, primarily in black churches, they have sort of a hierarchy among uh, men in the church who believe they have the gift of pastor, uh, pastor, teacher, and they really function in a role as a servant to the pastor. And this is important because it teaches humility. If you don't learn humility and you don't learn authority orientation as you are uh, growing up before you become a pastor, then you will never be a good leader and a good pastor. general rule of thumb is to be a good leader, you have to be a good follower. The reason is because you have to learn authority orientation. And you always see this with young men, that is, young in the development of their spiritual gift. You often see it with seminary students that they become, and I was this way when I was uh, in seminary, all of a sudden you think you know more than your mentors or your teachers because you are filled with knowledge that you haven't had time to really assimilate yet. And this works itself out in many different ways. But one thing I have seen in these, in some of the black churches is this emphasis that these, these men who believe they have the gift of pastor teacher are there to serve the pastor. And I remember the first time I was, would go to a uh, church and and, and teach, I would drive up, and there would be two guys out there 
uh, young young men who thought they had the gift of pastor teacher. One would be opening my door, the other would be getting my briefcase out of the back. I remember preaching in one church, and I had a terrible cold and was coughing. And each time I would I would cough, I'd turn around, and one of the men behind me would have opened a, a package, a, you know, the wrapper of the lozenge, and have it spread out, and that lozenge would be just right there. Uh, if I needed to get a Kleenex, he was right there handing it to me. Uh, I'm not saying that's the way it should always be done, but they were learning this whole area of being a servant to someone in authority. It showed tremendous respect for the pastor, for the position, for the authority of a pastor, and that's what is emphasized here with uh, in this phrase that Elisha poured water on the hands of Elijah. He was learning authority orientation. Verse 12, we read, And Jehoshaphat said, The word of the Lord is with him. He agreed. Yes, Elisha is the prophet of God. So the king of Israel and Jehoshaphat and the king of Edom uh, went down to him. And Elisha said in verse 14, As the Lord of hosts lives before whom I stand, surely were it not that I regard the presence of Jehoshaphat, king of Judah, I would not look at you nor see you. Now, that's really an interesting phrase that I regard the presence of Jehoshaphat, king of Judah. It means to look at someone. It means to um, be aware of their of the presence of someone there. And it's the same word that's used over in Psalm sixty six eighteen. If I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear. And the point of that verse, of course, is that if we see, that word regard means to look at or see, if we see that there is sin in our life, the idea of self-examination, then the Lord will not hear. We, we're out of fellowship. Our prayers will not be heard. That is heard effectively. Uh, God will not pay attention to them, and God will not answer them. We have to be in fellowship in order to uh, effectively pray. 2 Kings 3.14 is using it in a different con- context. God sees that Jehoshaphat is there, and so there is going to be a blessing by association. He is not blessing them because this is a God-ordained mission. He, his blessing is there simply because of his plans and purposes for Jehoshaphat, and because Jehoshaphat is there, God is going to provide for their needs. If he were not there, he would ignore them. Verse 15 We have a rather enigmatic verse, and Elisha says, Now bring me a musician. And then it happened when the musician played that the hand of the Lord came upon him. Now what in the world is going on in this particular uh, verse? This is one of those rather enigmatic verses we run into in Scripture related to the role of the prophet. A point I made last time and will make as we go through this passage is that we are often surprised by things in the Scripture, and we are surprised by God. God doesn't fit in our little box that we develop from our categories. Not that we can't know Him truly, but we cannot know Him exhaustively. And I keep saying that because I want you to realize that God isn't controlled by us. We'll never really control all the knowledge about God or of some things that go on in in the Scripture. There are some rather uh, enigmatic things that are there, and one of those has to do with the role of the prophet. We often think of the prophet as uh, simply someone who foretold the future, and I have pointed out the error of that many times, that the role of the prophet was one who represented God and would bring the word of God to the people or would uh, confront or indict the people because of their disobedience to God. So he is a representative of God. And in that way, we see the prophet function many times, uh, bringing about or exposing sin in the life of the nation or the life of individuals or the life of the leader as it is in violation of the Mosaic law. But we also see this word, this Hebrew word, nevi'im, used, that's a plural for prophets, or nevi, the singular. We see that used in some interesting context related to music. For example, in Exodus 15:20, we read about Miriam 
the prophetess, the sister of Aaron, took the timbrel in her hand, and all the women went out after her with timbrels and with dances. And then we have the song of victory that they sang, reflecting upon how God gave the Jews victory in the battle over their uh, enemies in the Exodus and over the uh, Egyptians. In Judges 4.4, 4, we're told that Deborah was a prophetess who judged Israel at the time. I, this is not focusing on prophet, prophecy as preaching. That's not what this means at all. Don't confuse those two. The role of prophet is completely different. She's a prophetess, the wife of Lapidoth. She's judging Israel at the time. Deborah is an indictment on all the wimpy males in Israel at the time, by the way, because... Uh, when she judged Israel, it was because the men had all wimped out and no men would step to the forefront uh, to lead. And when God did uh, give her uh, information about defeating those that were oppressing them at the time, the Canaanites, uh, Sisera, specifically, she called upon Barak, the general, to lead the army against them. And he said, well, I'll only go if you go with me. I mean, he's just the classic example of the wimpy male in the Scripture. And so she told him that, well, because you won't follow the command of the Lord and you want to have a woman go with you, you're not going to get the honor and glory of winning the battle. That will go to a woman who will uh, kill the woman. And that's when um, uh, Sisera uh, was literally nailed uh, by uh, the wife of Jael when she drove, when he was worn out, fell asleep, she drove a tent peg through his head. So, But after that, Deborah composed a hymn, a hymn of victory. Again, we have this relationship of being a prophetess or the gift of prophecy with music. In First Chronicles 25.3, we read of Jedithan, the sons of, uh, the, uh, the sons of Jedithan, Gedaliah, Zeri, Jeshiah, uh, Shimei, Hashabiah, and Mattathias, six, under the direction of their father Jedithan, who prophesied with a harp to give thanks and to praise the Lord. So we see that part of the role of being a prophet had to do with giving thanks and praise to God, the writing of psalms and and hymns and singing praise to God, that that was part of the function of the prophet, and that this was set to music so that it would be remembered by the people. When we sing songs, uh, we remember things. Last week after Bible class, there was a uh, <clears throat> young girl here who was about, I think she's about five years old, and I asked her what she'd learned in class that morning, and so she was telling me uh, that she'd learned about Rebecca, the wife of Isaac. And I said, well, who was Isaac's father? She said, Abraham. I said, and then her mother said, well, she can tell you the 12 tribes of Israel. And so she listed, I think she got 10 of the 12 right. She missed two. And then she said, but she knows the song of the, for the 12 apostles. Now, I'm not going to embarrass any of you here and say how many of you can name the 12, uh, the 12 disciples. But the kids in prep school have a song, and they can sing it, and I ought to have them come out here one day and have them sing that for the congregation because they can sing a little song, and, they, and it covers all the names of all the, all the disciples. And that's a good, we ought to learn that. They can sing songs to, uh, to cover all the books of the Old Testament. They sing songs to cover all the books of the New Testament. And so by singing, uh, we, we can remember things, putting things to music. And I believe that this was part of the role of, of the, those who prophesied. We also have these other enigmatic passages, such as Numbers 11.25, with the 70 elders, and the Spirit came upon them, and they prophesied, and it never happened again. But it doesn't say anything more about that. First Samuel 10, 10 and 11. After Samuel was anointed by, I mean, after Saul was anointed by Samuel, uh, he's out in the, in the hills and he comes across a group of prophets. And we're told in First Samuel 10, 10 that a spirit of God came upon him and he prophesied among them. And it happened when all who knew him formally saw that he indeed prophesied among the prophets that the people said to one another, What is this that has come upon the son of Kish? Is Saul also among the prophets? Now, this isn't some kind of mystical thing that occurs. 
Uh, I believe that the clues related to music are important and that that has to do with the fact that they sang these hymns and songs and gave thanks to God. And so that is part of the role of prophesying, and it helps us to understand what is going on here when we are told that Elisha called for someone to come and, uh, and to play, uh, play music. And in verse uh, 15, we read, But now bring me a musician. Then it happened when the musician played that the hand of the Lord came upon him, and he said. So I think that what he is saying is going to be later uh, put into some form of music. And this is what he says, verse 17 through 19. Thus says the Lord, You shall not see wind, nor shall you see rain, Yet that valley shall be filled with water. Excuse me, I left out verse 16, which is important. Verse 16 is, thus says the Lord, make this valley full of ditches. Now what's important about that is that's the only imperative, that's the only command in this whole section, is it there to dig ditches. And then what happens is the prophet, uh, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, is going to tell them what God will do as a result of that. But the only thing they're commanded to do is to dig ditches. For thus says the Lord, You shall not see wind, nor shall you see rain, yet that valley shall be filled with water, so that uh, you, your cattle, and all your animals may drink. And this is a simple matter in the sight of the Lord. He also will deliver the Moabites into your hand. And also you shall attack every fortified city and every choice city and shall cut down every good tree, stop up every spring of water, and ruin every good piece of land with stones. Now this is really a key passage in this, in this whole section. And the reason is, is because we have to ask the question, is Elisha telling them what to do, or is Elisha telling them what's going to happen? Now think about that. Is Elisha telling them what to do, that they are to, uh, when it comes down to verse 18, that they are, excuse me, verse 19, that they, is he telling them to attack every fortified city and every choice city and cut down every good tree, stop up every spring and ruin every good piece of land? Or is he simply saying this is what they will do as a result of what happens in verses 17 and 18? Most people that you read will take it that what happens in verse 19 is a command to go and do these things. But it's very interesting to deal with the Hebrew verbs here because oftentimes in Hebrew, when you have certain uh, tense shifts, uh, certain things are going on here, and you have imperfect tenses initially, and then it shifts to perfect tenses, and I'm not going to get into a lot of technical matters there. But what I believe this indicates grammatically is that uh, you shift fr from the initial command to dig ditches to a description of what will happen afterwards. And a description is not a command. And this is backed up by the fact, or my view is backed up by the fact, that in Deuteronomy 20, verses 19 and 20, when God instructed the Israelite uh, the Israelites, when they were going to engage in holy war as they entered into Canaan, he said, when you besiege a city a long time to make war against it in order to capture it, you shall not destroy its trees by swinging an axe against them, for you may eat from them, and you shall not cut them down, for is the tree of the field a man that it should be besieged by you? Only the trees which you know are not fruit trees you shall destroy and cut down, that you may construct siege works against the city that is making war with you, until it falls. So there is two, there are two commands that are important in Deuteronomy. One is that the Israelites are not to oppress or take possession of Moab. And the second direct command is that they're not supposed to wipe out the food trees. They're not supposed to destroy the land, stop up the wells, and all of these other things. So if verse 19 is a command from God, it is in contradiction to things that are stated in Deuteronomy. And number that's number one. Number two is if they are being commanded to uh, 
want to attack Moab and to take control of it, then this is in violation of Deuteronomy. So I believe that what is being described here in verse 19 is what the, the army is going to do, not what God is telling them to do. The only thing he tells them to do is to uh, dig these ditches. And what will happen overnight is that there will be a rainstorm so far away that they don't even hear the thunder. They don't see the flash of lightning. They don't see anything. And then there will be these flash floods that come about, and the water will come down through these wadis and fill up the ditches uh, in the early morning, and then something remarkable will take place. And that's exactly what it happens today. The last, the last time we were in Israel, we went to Qumran, and if you're standing there at Qumran, it's extremely rugged as the all of these uh, hills are coming down towards the Dead Sea, and you see these uh, huge valleys that have been cut uh, into that soft, uh, soft rock there, the soft sandstone. And it's very dangerous because it can rain in Jerusalem. And if you're at Qumran, which is only about 30 or 40 miles away, you don't even know that it's raining in Jerusalem. And just a couple of months before we were there, there had been this uh, rainstorm, just about a 20-minute rainstorm. It doesn't rain for long, in Jer- in over near Jerusalem. And they had no idea what was going on, but they received a warning call, and there was a group of hikers and climbers that were halfway up this gorge and they were trying to get their attention to warn them to get out of the way because a flash flood would come in about 30 minutes and that's what happened and there were two or three unfortunately that lost their lives and they were unable to really reach them and warn them as what was happening and so this is pretty typical in that part of the uh, of the uh, of, of Israel and so this is what occurred and there were these flash floods that came down, and f- they came down in the in the Negev area there, and filled these pits that they had dug with water. So they were able to drink water. Their animals were able to be watered. But God created a used the sun and light the next morning to create an optical illusion, so that when the Moabites looked at the water, it looked as if it was all. It was all blood, and they jumped to the conclusion that there had been a fight, a falling out among the uh, Israelites, the Judahites, and the Edomites, and they had all uh, fought each other, and so this was the time to attack, and this is described in verse 23. They said, this is the blood, the kings have surely struck swords and have killed one another. Now therefore, Moab, to the spoil." So when they came to the camp of Israel, Israel rose up and attacked the Moabites so that they fled before them, and they entered their land, that is, the Jews entered their land, killing the Moabites. Then verse 25 is the fulfillment of what Elisha said they would do back in verse 19. Then they destroyed the cities. Each man threw a stone on every good piece of land and filled it. That is, they were destroying the agricultural capability of the Moabites. They stopped up all the springs of water uh, in order to uh, uh, hinder their getting all the water they needed, both for survival as well as for agriculture. And they cut down all the good trees. Now, remember, they were prohibited from doing that. They could use the hardwoods for... Uh, constructing uh, breastworks, etc., as long as they weren't fruit trees, and the fruit trees they were to leave uh, standing. And then they attacked the city Kir Hariseth, and you see Kir Hariseth located here just under the M in Moab. And they attacked that city, and they're on the uh, edge of having victory when we read in uh, verse 27... But the king of Moab took his eldest son, who would have reigned in his place, and offered him as a burnt offering. So all of the other uh, descriptions, some of the verses I've skipped over, just describe describe some of the tactics and strategies they have. uh, uh, The Moabites sought to win. They're just they have their backs against the wall, literally. And so Misha takes his oldest son and offers him as a burnt offering. He kills him and burns him as an offering on the walls of Kir Haraseth. I mean, this just just appalls the Israelites, of course, with this, uh, this display of paganism, but it's the turning point in the battle. He offered him as a burnt offering upon the wall, and there was great wrath or great indignation against Israel. 
Now, how are we to understand this? Uh, this is really a rather perplexing verse because if um, if this offering to Chemosh, the god of Moab, is it seems to have it gives them victory. It seems to have inspired the people, and so one view is that the great indignation is on the part of the Moabites. They are just roused to anger because the king has had to sacrifice his oldest son. So now they're they're uh, inspired to go out and fight even harder, and they turn back the Israelites. There's another view that it, this is Israel's indignation, and they become so incensed that they leave, but the text says there was great indignation against Israel. And then the third view is that this is God's wrath. It doesn't say it's God's wrath, but there are seven times in the Old Testament where you have the phrase great indignation, great wrath, and every time it's a, it's a distinct word for great and a distinct word for wrath every time it's used. It's used of God. There's only one passage where this word for wrath is used of man. Every other place it's used of God. And when it's combined with this word for great in those seven instances, including this one, it always refers to the wrath of God. And so God's wrath is brought against Israel because they're still out of his will. He hasn't ordered them to defeat He has told to defeat the Moabites. He hasn't ordered them to go into battle. That was the point I was making about Elisha's command, uh, what Elisha was saying, that it wasn't a command. It was simply a description. God is going to bless them to a point and give them a certain measure of victory, but he's not going to give them the total victory because that would be a blessing for the house of Ahab that, that he is about to judge. And so this is one of those really strange episodes where God just doesn't act like we think he's going to act. We read through the story and we think, well, God's going to give him a great victory at the end, and he doesn't. It's the same kinds of things happen in our life. We think God is doing one thing and something else happens. And when that happens in many people's lives, what they do is they react against God. They think that God has forgotten them, that why is God doing this to me? And they start asking a lot of uh, questions uh, uh, of that nature rather than trusting in God. Uh, There are other things that happen in our lives that are unexpected. Sometimes we have unexpected blessings. Sometimes we have unexpected adversities. And the issue is, are we going to handle those circumstances, those problems, those adversities, on the basis of God's Word. What we see in the Old Testament as well as the New Testament is in order to face and surmount adversity, we have to be oriented to God's Word. That is primary. We really have to understand who God is and what His plan is. And see, this was a failure in this incident. They did not understand. They were not applying Deuteronomy. And so they were engaged in a wrong activity. They did attempt, and Jehoshaphat, I think, sincerely attempted to seek the Lord, which is true of many believers, but because of a lack of of knowledge of God's Word, they seek the Lord, but they still engage in a wrong activity. And so there's God, because of His grace, often blesses us or keeps us from experiencing the uh, real uh, consequences of our actions. And that we mistake that for God's blessing on our course of action. And that, I think, was the case with the Israelites up to the final uh, battle that they lost, and then they retreated and went back, uh, went back to their own land. So the point, I think, of this passage is that we dare not fall into the trap of putting God in a box, of thinking we really understand what he is doing in our lives and what he is going to do in our lives, or that how he is going to bring about these things. We dare not be presumptuous, but we must be oriented to his word. And the only way you can know these things is to truly study the word and really know it. And that was the failure here, is that they really did not know and understand God's word, and so they were doing a wrong thing, a wrong way, and then they were trying to cover it up and camouflage it with a justification of, well, we sought the will of God with the prophet. But the prophet wasn't telling them what to do other than digging the ditches. He was simply describing what they would do. With our heads bowed and our eyes closed. 
Father, we know that you love us. You love us so much that you gave your son to uh, come to this earth, to die on the cross, to pay the penalty for our sins. Father, you loved us, and, and you gave us your word. And as we study your word, we come to understand many things about you. We understand many true things about you, but there are things about you that do perplex us because you are an infinite God full of knowledge and wisdom that go far beyond our knowledge and our understanding. And you know facts that are far beyond our understanding and that we will never know or fully comprehend. And so, Father, the only thing that is left is for us to trust you. Father, there may be some here this morning who are not saved, who have no uh, understanding of the need for salvation, they have no understanding of how to be saved, but Scripture says that all of us have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. We are all under condemnation, we're born under condemnation, but that you provided a perfect plan of salvation for us through your Son, Jesus Christ, who died on the cross for our sins. <coughs> Father, it is our prayer that if you are here this morning, that, uh, and you have never trusted Christ as Savior, that you'll take this opportunity to do that, to put your faith and trust in him, because he alone can provide salvation. You may not understand all of the issues, all of the details. You may have many questions. But as we see in our study, uh, we will not always ha- be able to answer these questions or know the answer. The issue simply is to trust in Christ. And as we do, and as we study, and as we grow, some of the questions will be answered, but some will be left unanswered. Now, Father, we pray that you challenge us with the things we studied this morning, and we pray this in Christ's name. Amen.